You're all saying things that they can't take back. Feels good, feels right, it don't end. Every night when the quiet gets loud, hate that I know. Honorable guest, program director, president of Alsa UUM, Alsa UUM board that members, Alsa UUM members and fellow participants. A very good evening and welcome all of you to Alsa UUM legal webinar second episode, data protection. Is it safe for you to share all your personal information? First of all, thank you for finding your time to take part in our legal webinar this evening. And we hope everyone will be able to gain some valuable insights from this evening legal webinar. Before we start our webinar today, do allow me to announce several house rules. Kindly ensure that your microphone is muted throughout the session to avoid any disturbance. Feel free to open your camera and utilize the chat box as well as the reaction for a more engaging environment. My name is Chua Kai Shen. Currently, the second semester LLB student from University Utara, Malaysia, and I'll be your moderator for today's legal webinar. To formally begin our webinar this evening, we seek your cooperation to honor our national anthem, Biruwana, and Alsa anthem. So 
Thank you very much. Next, let's welcome Saudara Muhammad Amin bin Ahmad Kamal to lead the prayer recitation. Let's welcome Saudara Amin. Auzubillah minash shaitanir rajim. Al Fatiha. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين المسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم on this blessed day we express our gratitude to you for allowing us to attend the ceremony of UUM legal webinar episode two data protection is for you to share your all your confidential information we seek your blessing for a flawless progress of this event from the beginning till the end. We seek your guidance to clear the event, the rest of this event. Ya Latif, Ya Rahman, please bless us with your taufik and hidayat. Please guide University of Utara Malaysia and also UUM to greatness, peace, glory, and prosperity in this world and the hereafter. Make us a lebanon that will be beneficial to mankind in order to gain your madatillah. Make us your right servant that follow your command and neglect the sinful act. Please, and for our wrongdoing. Ya Munzil al-Barakat. Bestow peace to our beloved country, Malaysia. Preserve us from any trade and disaster. Neither man-made, no natural disaster. And to you, Ya Allah, we ask for security and prosperity upon us. Our leader and our country. Bestow patience in us in order to face the challenges from you. Please, please. Konli, Rabbana atina fi dunia hasanah, wa fil ahirati hasanah, wa kina azabana. Wa subhana rabbana adatama isifu, wa salam ala salim. Amin. Thank you, Saudara Amin, for the du'a's recitation. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's world, data law protection around the world aims to give back individual control over the data, empowering individuals to know how their data is being used by whom and why. Giving them control over their personal data is being processed and used. Therefore, more and more privacy regulations worldwide are implemented. Everyone responsible for using personal data has to follow strict rules called data protection principles. We can see that under the Data Protection Act 2018, it contains a set of principles that organizations, government, and businesses have to adhere to in order to keep someone's data accurate, safe, secure, as well as lawful. Do you know up to April 2020, there are 66% of countries have adopted data protection and privacy legislation. Among other continents, Europe has the highest adoption rate of such legislation, which is 96%, with 43 countries out of 45 countries. Well, we can see that Asia Pacific has only 57% of adoption rate. And for now, as we are in the pandemic COVID-19, we spend even more time on the devices and technologies for our daily needs, such as online shopping. In the meantime, this indicates that we are exposing the greater surface to be attacked by the criminals in the sense of they will keep on finding more at one's way to penetrate our devices or even exploit our personal data. Hence, 
it is no less important for us to know more about legal knowledge pertaining to our data protection. Before we start today, do allow me to introduce our honorable panelists for today's session. Participants, you may also refer to the manual guideline for more detailed panelist biodata that we have sent to you via WhatsApp. Ladies and gentlemen, do allow me to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Ani Munira Binti Mohammad. Dr. Ani is a senior lecturer from School of Law, University of Uttara Malaysia, where she expertise in cyber law, information technology law, as well as comparative law. Dr. Ani holds a Master of Chartered Professional in Islamic Finance, CIFP, from INCIF and PG Diploma in Higher Education Learning and Teaching from University of Uttara Malaysia. She also holds a Master of Comparative Law and Postgraduate Diploma in Sharia Law and Practice from the IIUM. Dr. Ani then obtained her PhD in Law from University Technology Mara UITM. She has great passion for e-government initiatives around the world, particularly on the sub-areas of e-courts, e-justice, and e-communications between the judiciary and the general public. Moving on, the second panelist is Dr. Zuati Binti Mohamed Yusuf. Dr. Zuati is the Associate Professor in University of Uttara Malaysia, whose areas of interest include law of thought and obligation, personal data protection law, comparative law. Dr. Zuati graduated with Bachelor of Law from the International Islamic University Malaysia, IIUM. She also holds a Master in Comparative Law from the International Islamic University Malaysia, IIUM. She then obtained her PhD in Privacy Law from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. In 2018, Dr. Zuati was awarded with Master's Certificate in Women Leadership from the Pusat Kepipinan Wanita, Tun Fatima Hashim. She also publicized law regarding research and articles not only on data protection and privacy law, but also issues concerning cybersecurity, children, smart home development, and others. Next, our third panelist for today's webinar is Mr. Damien Segaran, who is currently a partner of Segaran Law Chambers. Mr. Damien graduated with LRB with Honours in University of the West of England, Bristol. He was also the barrister at law in Honourable Society of Grace Inn. Mr. Damien was Certified Information Privacy Manager, or we known as CIPM, of International Association for Privacy Professionals, IAPP. He expertise in various fields including labor law, technology law, data protection compliance, cybersecurity regulation, emerging tech and AI regulation, industrial relations, commercial litigation, as well as commercial trade advisory. Last but not least, our last panelist is Ms. John. Mr. John was born in Spain and with a full career in IT, but then he moved to Malaysia in 2012. He graduated from the Universita Politecnica di Valencia, UPV, in the study of telecommunications engineering. Mr. John currently is the founder and CEO of the IO Foundation and also the global coordinator of Project Lockdown. Mr. John can be considered as a multilingual as he speaks various languages, including English, French, Spanish, and Catalan. In 2018, he took the leap of founding the IO Foundation to establish a more solid and targeted direction to address digital rights for users. Before we start our session today, here's a gentle reminder. Participants, you may drop down any questions to the speakers at the chat box and the questions will be asked to the speakers during the question and answer session. Dear participants, you may also refer to the questions in the manual guideline they have prepared for you via WhatsApp group. Without further ado, let us welcome our first panelist, Dr. Ani, to give her insights for this webinar. Please welcome Dr. Ani. Good day, Dr. Ani. Hello, Kaishi. Good day. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm fine, Dr. Ani. Thank you so much, Dr. Ani, for joining us on this lovely evening for our webinar today. And Dr. Ani, I believe with your experience teaching cyber law, IT law, and as well as your expertise in this area, would enlighten us with your opinions regarding our main issue tonight, which pertaining to the data protection. Well, Dr. Ani, I would like to ask, 
as we can see nowadays, data protection law actually regulates how one's personal data is used by businesses, governments, or even organizations. However, Dr. Ani, we can see that studies show some of the cyber-related risks have brought great challenges to the government. So in your opinion, how far can cybercrime pol uh, policies limit the issues of these cybercrimes? And in what way does the launch of the ID security application, as we can see a lot of security application, help in securing the personal data and shouting privacy of the citizens? So we have Dr. Aini. Welcome, Dr. Aini. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Kai Shing and everybody in this meeting room. I see that many of you uh, are using this wonderful and beautiful background. Uh, I am so sorry because I have purchased this very expensive laptop that does not even allow me to change the uh, the, the background. So I said uh, I might as well uh, return back to my old laptop that I cannot, uh, that probably I can uh, change my background to somewhat uh, as beautiful as you guys uh, are using okay no worries um, dr annie we will have you in our future event as well <laughs> okay um all right so uh when i first was approached for this particular topic on data privacy law and uh how um the uh, the, the cyber crime law would um actually protect uh, what are the measures that can be used to protect so i was like wow this is so huge so many things that uh, i wish to share so many the scope is too huge something that i would normally teach in one entire semester yeah but uh, i am asked to, to to limit it to uh, one uh, 20 20 minutes presentation okay um, in any event, there are so many things that you have posted on the screen as well, data protection law, and then it goes back to the cyber-related risk for public and private organizations, maybe it's not mentioned here, but uh, cyber-related risk, uh, and then how the cybercrime policies, and then we have specific um, uh, applications okay, to help to protect our personal data. Now. Uh, I would like to step back a little bit before I go and answer your questions, uh, Kaishin. First and foremost about data protection law. What do we actually mean by data protection law? Is it a law that says that no one can use your data? Is it a law that says that you can or cannot share your data? For example, I'm so excited to send my boy to the school today because I'm so excited. Can I share the location of me? Just send my lovely boy to the school, for example send location share location on facebook for example or um, yay my son has already graduated from uh, kindergarten probably again i share the location and then uh, i i think i want to go on vacation and then share location again okay so that is something that we normally think that uh, is the data protected okay but it comes back to the law that we have is actually to not to say that you can or cannot share some information, but it is to teach us to be wise. Okay, we are we should be wise enough. What is it that we share? Okay, because when any cybercrime, because the second part of my presentation is actually on cybercrime. The first part is data protection law. The second part is for cybercrime. So when we talk about cybercrime, there are so, so many laws out there. Okay. Okay. Before we go for cybercrime, we have to talk about what instigates or what motivates that to happen. So that's why when you see the sentence here, the protection law regulates how it's your businesses, governments, or organizations. Okay. Um, I do not wish to bore everybody in this meeting room today with um, a law lecture. Okay. You can get that from the law classes following the syllabus. And what I wish to share with you is um, actually, if I may share my screen, uh, can I share? Yeah, sure, Dr. Aini. Just go on. Yeah, I think you may. Okay. Can you share now? Okay, okay. thank you, Doctor. Okay, I, I think you can see my screen. Okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So the first question we need to ask, do we have data protection law in Malaysia? Okay, you say, what is your definition? So when I ask you, do we have data protection law in Malaysia? It actually goes back to what is your definition? Okay. So I wish to talk about, is it the law that protects your data? It says, wow, I'm sharing my status on Facebook 
or Instagram. So it is protected now. Okay? It's questionable, right? Likewise, when you see a law that says people can or cannot use our data, a law that says you can or cannot share your personal information. So uh, in the background just now, you have already mentioned about the Personal Data Protection Act principles under the Act. Again, I do not wish to go through one by one of these on general notice and choice, disclosure, but just probably uh, one or two sentences just to summarise. Okay, just to summarize, and definitely it's not sufficient, it's not adequate for me to explain all about the Data Protection Act uh, principles. Okay, but in any event, okay, it simply, if I can summarize it, is the PDPA 2010 will be applicable in order to set up the ground rules. Okay. What are the rights and responsibilities of the person collecting your information? And what are the rights and responsibilities of the person giving that information? And in this context, it's us. Yeah? Actually, we can be in both. Yeah, we can be the person who is collecting or we can also be the person who gives that information. But what is most important is the second, second one. Yeah? Notice and choice. We agree to give that information and this is uh, the the... The, the terms and conditions of giving that notice, okay? only when you read and then you say you agree, then you sign, then you will be uh, uh, covered. Now, let me just bring you to one situation, which is not a real life, okay? real life. Why? Because everybody knows about this. This is e -Penjana, Okay, I'm sure many of you have come across this before. Many of you are well aware of this uh, e-penjana and this is a public information i have googled it and i found it so this is not to say attaching with that not to say to any specific companies because this is all public information which has been approved by the um, budget yeah, by the government and it is published on the website i'm only using this for an example okay now when we come to know that we can get that information okay so I install uh, my Sejahtera. I install Touch and Go e-wallet on my phone and probably many of you as well. And probably Boost, probably Grab. Yeah, you also install it on your uh, uh, smartphones. So this idea or this urge inside of me triggered when many of my Facebook friends uh, have uploaded on their status that said, wow, I recently got 30 ringgit from e -Pajana. I got 50 ringgit from e -Pajana. So that triggered me to take a look at what is it actually? Yeah? Does everybody here know what e -Pajana is? Yeah, it's an incentive by the government for people who can uh, claim, provided they download and install and use this uh, e-wallet from authorized companies. Yeah? And one of which is the example that I am using today. Everything sounds nice yeah, because it comes from the government. Until I take a look at what are, what is the strategy yeah, that we can go through and it says, okay, now, again, I do not wish to bore you, so I'm just going to summarize what is it. It is a government initiative. It is given through your touch and go e-wallet, grab and boost. Yeah, there is a timeline when you can claim it. And so I say, oh, okay, why not? I try it. Okay, so then I take a look at the eligibility criteria. So I'm not going to ask how many people in this meeting room today have already collected or have already claimed this. But um, I hope okay, how I approach it, it will be more to academic discussion and probably something we can take away okay, from the uh, sharing today. Okay? The fundamental requirements include yeah, 18 years old and above. Okay, uh, annual income less than 100,000 and be a registered user of my Sejahtera app. Okay, so these are all the how to install uh, my Sejahtera and also how to go to e-penjana from there until it comes to claim the 50 ringgit from Touch and Go in Wallet. Uh -huh. Okay, so it says claim now, verify your full name, click yes and submit. Okay, and then there is a requirement for us to take a photo while we are holding our I see. So I was thinking, oh, okay, is this something that I want to do? Okay, why not? Yeah, because the information will go to the government anyway. And then I read the terms and condition. Let's take a look at the terms and condition. Okay. 
Now, if you do take some time to go through it, PDPA is mentioned inside here. We are hoping, I am hoping that everybody here is familiar with the uh, Personal Data Protection Act 2010 already. Okay? But uh, the introduction would be uh, what I have shared in the slide here. Okay? The principles under, the, uh, let me just do this. I hope you can still uh, see my screen. Um, all right, the principles under the Data Protection Act. Okay, everything seems nice, everything seems fine. Okay, and then I read the rights of the individual, right to access, right to correct, right to withdraw consent, right to prevent processing, meaning I can access the information that I have given to the company. I have the right to do some correction to the information. And now I am not happy, I can withdraw my consent, the ones that I have given. I, uh, I also have the right to prevent processing, which is likely to cause damage. I think it will cause damage, so I don't want it anymore. I want to prevent the processing of that information. Or the fifth one is to pre prevent uh, processing if there is a likelihood that it will be used for direct marketing. So let's go here. Okay? Yeah, eligibility criteria. Okay, we know this. And then we have that program incentive, talking about the 50 ringgit e -pajana. Okay, And then... Here comes the interesting part, personal data protection. I don't know how to remove this part. Yeah, is it possible? Okay, yeah, it is possible so that I can maximize my screen just to share with you. Okay, all right. By applying this program, the data privacy notice touching good e-wallet that have been provided to you will apply. Okay, that sounds fair. In addition to the data privacy notice, you agree here comes the tricky part. You agree and consent to us, our subsidiaries, and any of our affiliated companies collecting, storing, using, processing, and disclosing your personal data. Oh, wow. I don't even know who is the affiliated companies, who is the subsidiary of Touch and Go. Yeah? Which includes, okay, what is the data? N includes but not limited to law students. Okay? If you are, uh, I think majority here are law students, do you know is the meaning of includes but not limited to? Meaning it is not, ex, uh, how should I, uh, it's not, uh, it's not limited, okay? It is extensive, meaning it could be a, even a wider scope. What is mentioned here, your name, IC, address, mobile phone number, bank account details, wow. Bank statements, wow. And transaction information, again, wow. Includes, but not limited to. So I'm wondering, what else? Okay, what else is under the scope? It doesn't matter now, because we have given the consent, because we want that 50 ringgit. Okay, okay. two. Okay. All right, so who will that information be revealed to? Provide and disclose your personal data to service providers. Aha. Uh -huh which may be located outside Malaysia. Wow, okay. Now, the reason why I say wow is because PDPA 2010 is limited to organizations, to businesses operating in Malaysia and the provisions will be in Malaysia. So when it says here at the last stage, everything here will be processed according to the Personal Data Protection Act 2010. It will be processed according to the PDPA 2010, but here we have already given our consent, which may be located outside of Malaysia. Okay, so there are a lot of things. Uh, there are a lot of other things that you can go through okay, in this um, uh, in this uh, information. Just to say, it's a very simple thing. It comes in a package which is very nicely put for us, endorsed by the government, only to read in between the lines because if you are a law student then you might be thinking oh how do i say this when you sign up for an email you don't actually read the terms and condition right you sign up for a, a new email address you sign up uh agree to the terms and condition yes okay check mark yes check mark uh check mark yes agree proceed yes okay you don't even read so here in this case oh wow so my action upon reading this and reading 
uh, a few other things. Okay? So I re uh, provide personal to relevant third party service providers. It's so blurry. Okay? So you wouldn't know who is the relevant third party service providers according to whom? According to the definition of Cash and Go or definition of S? definition of the company so when i started this movement uh, i think in 2020 okay, uh, because i'm not sure it's 2020 2019 okay when ipiano was uh, started to in uh, i think it's 2019 when we still have that face-to-face uh, -face classes with students um uh, i my, my status got shared many times okay, uh, uh, on facebook i shared uh, on the awareness of the pba 2010 and the awareness of ipiano i become not not a famous person i have to say many people share but i become not a famous person a lot of things people say to me for example they say uh, this person if she doesn't want the 30 ringgit at the time 30 ringgit don't stop people from using it yeah i say oh it's my it's part of my phd it's part of my expertise for me to inform everyone of what i know yeah so i shared with them these rights some of them do PM me, a private message me and ask, uh, Dr. Hani, how do I, what, what will happen if I have already given my consent and what can I do? Okay, no problem. You have the right to withdraw. You remember? Here, the right to withdraw consent. So they contacted the company and the company said, sorry, you cannot withdraw. Okay, so I think the fine line here is because that 50 ringgit or the 30 ringgit has already been given. The consideration has already passed. So, um, um, I don't know. I don't know about uh, everybody else in this meeting room today. A very simple thing which has been packaged well. So, when we do not meet the terms and conditions, we will suffer in the end. Okay. So, to answer the question by Kaishing, Mr. Moderator, just now, um, how is it, how is it, um, how do I see this? Um, how do I, uh, how do we address or how do we tackle yeah, the uh, the principle, the, the, the cyber crimes or the things that might happen yeah, in the aftermath of uh, sharing that information yeah, uh, by using the law? Okay, so when I talk about cyber or computer crimes, yeah, that's the question, the terminology used by Mr. Moderator just now in the, uh, in, in the question. Okay? How does the law help us to protect? Yeah, how does the law help us to protect the uh, personal data that we have um, uh, around? Okay? Uh, who here thinks, yeah, from the participants today, who here thinks that the provisions of Computer Crimes Act 1997 is adequate yeah, in addressing cyber crimes in Malaysia? Yeah? Can you type in the chat box and let me know who thinks that Computer Crimes Act 1997 is adequate in addressing cyber crimes. Yeah? Because that will lead me to the next question. What is your definition of cyber crimes? Computer Crimes Act 1997, a very famous, um, a very famous um, statute yeah, on cyber crimes is it provides for three major crimes. Yeah? Three major crimes under the Computer Crimes Act. Very general ones. Yeah, I have to say it unauthorized access unauthorized access with modification unauthorized sorry unauthorized access unauthorized access with ulterior motive unauthorized modification okay sections three section four and section five, five yeah uh, the, the major ones minus all the uh, all the how shall i say abatement minus the attempts okay so these are the three major ones i have to say that they are not adequate if you what is your definition of cyber crime it falls back does that count yeah what is hacking everybody knows hacking getting access into somebody else's computer for example modification you go into the system and modify some information sending of viruses spamming yeah using somebody else's uh, card yeah for example but then again before you talk about Putting someone under the crimes, we have to talk about our control of sharing that information. So I am so happy to see the tagline of uh, outside webinar number two, okay, which is, is it safe 
to share your personal information okay all your personal information i don't have a very specific answer for that yeah because it falls back to your definition of personal data your definition of uh, cybercrime yeah uh dr ani sorry for the sorry for the interruption dr ani uh, sorry for the interruption. You have around yes. another two minutes to wrap up everything due to our time constraint. Perhaps okay. we could uh, discuss good. further yeah, on that. You know yeah, later okay. on. Okay, all right, good, good. Okay, so thank you, uh, I'm not going to go through one by one again. That's my, 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 how shall I say? I don't try to bore you at night. Uh, what is the law? Under what section? I just want to talk about uh, various policies and guidelines by NGOs. Apart from having that specific pieces of uh, that general pieces of legislation okay, on uh, cyber crimes and our control of the personal data. Let's uh, take a look at the various policies and guidelines by NGOs and government departments. The ministry, the MCMC, the, the Ministry of Multimedia and Communications, the uh, NGOs, the DG for example. So I'm just going to go very quickly. I think that's that's the last from me before I go. But very quickly, I wish to share with you a uh, one minute video because Kaishin says I have two minutes. So I'll share you one minute. Okay? This one minute video. DG Cyber Safe is one of the. Uh, it's supposed to go okay. DG Cyber Safe is one of the companies that is participating into the security or, or how we handle ourselves okay? uh, online. So I'm just, this is 49 seconds. I'm going to go very quickly. So, kuja pasal lagi ni. Yeah, um, with that, uh, I wish to uh, direct everyone's attention to DG CyberSafe, Click Dengan Bija, a lot of uh, initiatives put up by the government, by NGOs, by companies uh, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, increase awareness okay, uh, about the information that we share online so that uh, we can avoid the things to happen. So I would like to conclude my part uh, by saying that um, before we even talk about cyber crimes or crimes uh, against the perpetrators who might be conducting it. It is actually, it falls back to the personal data that we are sharing, personal data that we are willing to let other people know. Uh, it, there is a very famous saying that says, your information, once it is digitized and put online, you can never retrieve it back. Even though you delete that Facebook post in future, it will still be there. Okay, I don't know the technical term for that, but it will still be there, okay? And some other IT technical expert might be able to uh, track that information even though without any proper qualification, uh, just to say that it is there. Okay? So be safe, everyone. You can Google DG Cyber Safe, click dengan bijak, uh, and that's it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Brother Kaishin. That's from me. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ani. I would say it's very informative and insightful. And we are, even though we have the data protection law like PDPA, actually just like what mentioning by Dr. Ani, it's actually not adequate enough. And I really agree on the point that being mentioned by Dr. Ani that even though the application is launched by the government such as the My Sejahtera or even the Touch and Go Wallet, but then uh, we can see that actually our personal data still have the chance to be misused by the third party. And I would like to emphasize as a law student, we really need to be aware, especially when we access a uh, any application, we need to read the conditions one by one, line by line, and don't don't risk yourself for the sake of sort of benefit. Like uh, give you R fifty, you straight away uh, download the application and use it. So what I would say, we need to be a wise user. So thank you so much, Doctor Ani, and thank you so much. Uh, next, let's move on to our second panelist.
Dr. Zuati to further address this topic. Mm, good evening, Dr. Zuti. Yeah, good evening. Uh, Hello, everyone. Good evening, doctor. Hi, doctor. So, uh, thank you for spending your time for sharing your knowledge with us tonight, Dr. Zuati. So, I I'm pretty it. sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure with your experience as a lecturer in University of Tara Malaysia, as well as your expertise in this area, it's totally a right choice for us to investigate deeply in uh, pertaining to our issue tonight. So, uh, Dr. Zuati, as we can see, Malaysia was ranked as the fifth worst performer among 47 countries in the study of privacy protection and surveillance. As Malaysia, we only have the PDPA, or we known as the Personal Data Protection Act 2010, to protect our personal data. However, we can see that actually this act is not well developed. So, uh, Dr. Zuati, in your personal opinion, what are the insufficiencies of PDPA compared with other countries such as Europe? And what kind of approach can be taken by the authorities to improve and better our data protection law? So let us welcome Dr. Zuyati. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Kai. Um, respected speakers tonight, Dr. Ani, Mr. John, and also uh, Mr. Damien. Okay, um, uh, and last but not least, my beloved students and also the audience for uh, tonight's webinar. Okay, uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to uh, be sharing with all of you um, regarding um, personal data and uh, privacy. Okay, uh, so um, I would like to thank Dr. Ani because uh, she had already uh, made my job easier tonight. Okay, because uh, for the first uh, 10 minutes of uh, her presentation just now, he has already uh, shared with you the real scenario of uh, processing uh, of um, uh, processing of personal data, our personal data, eh, uh, by giving the example of my sejahtera and whatnot just now. Okay, um, and uh, because of the um, the time constraint for tonight, uh, I would not go into the detail of the uh, Personal Data Protection Act. However, I will uh, highlight a few um, key uh, key features and also the um, the weaknesses or the insufficiencies or the inadequacies of the uh, uh, Personal Data Protection uh, Act uh, 2010. Okay, um, so um, let me briefly uh, share my my um, slide. Okay, so uh, actually tonight uh, I would like to um, share the three important facts. Huh? The first one is, is about the PDPA itself. Um, the existing law. The only law that we have that protects uh, personal data is the PDPA. Uh, and uh, the second one is about the uh, inadequacy of the law, what are the witnesses and the way forward. And the third one is about lessons from other jurisdictions. Uh, um, maybe we, we can refer to uh, general data protection uh, regulation and also uh, New Zealand law, for example. Okay. So uh, actually, when we talk about uh, personal data, okay, uh, it is very much uh, relates to uh, uh, privacy, uh, meaning that the, the big umbrella is privacy. Okay, let me show you this um, definition uh, before that. Okay, this is the category of uh, privacy. Yeah? Uh, the big umbrella is the privacy law itself, and under that it comes uh, the physical privacy. Okay, meaning that um, is there is uh, if there is any intrusion into your physical, okay, physical uh, uh, body, okay, for example CCTV and whatnot, okay, it comes under physical privacy. Okay, the second one is communication and surveillance pri privacy. Okay, for example, um, uh, when someone uh, uh, install their CCTV, for example, okay, so it is a uh, communication and surveillance. Of privacy. The third one is territorial privacy. Okay, uh, whether uh, something that is shared in public sphere is considered as privacy or not, and and someone which is and something that is uh, shared uh, within private sphere is considered as a uh, privacy or not. If there is any any breach, and the last but not least, our uh, main uh, focus for tonight discussion is about uh, data privacy. Okay, so that is the the family of uh, privacy law okay and then um, let us uh, go a little bit about um, the
the definition of privacy itself eh, because uh, actually there is no precise definition of privacy okay because uh, um, the the situation that is private to someone it may be not a privacy for for the other person okay so there is no pre precise definition of privacy because it is a uh, highly uh, depending on the perspective eh? um, the understandings the context of the discussion the cultural and behavioral uh, behavioral uh, norms of the uh, citizens or society so those are the factors that will uh, determine uh, the definition of uh, privacy itself okay. however okay, we do have um, the general um, definition of uh, privacy okay whereby we can uh, apply this particular definition okay uh, uh, it means the state of limiting access of others to a certain modes of being in a people's life okay a situation of being inaccessible to others and is more than a control one has over personal information or physical beings okay that is basically what is uh, meant by uh, privacy okay so in malaysia when we talk about Malaysia, in the context of Malaysia, we have no, uh, we have no specific law on privacy. Okay, uh, meaning that we have no uh, common, um, um, we do not have a stand alone uh, uh, cause of action in privacy. Okay, um, and the the the, the cases, uh, maybe you have heard the cases of Maslinda, uh, the cases of you uh, you and uh, Sibarasa. Okay, those are the cases that uh, discuss about privacy. However, uh, it does not come to the stage that um, pronouncing us uh, privacy as a um, as a cause of action in Malaysia. Okay, so um, actually, what we have is is the protection for privacy interests. Okay, let's say if there is an interference to your um, uh, in, interference in case of trespass, huh? in case of trespass to person, for example, interference to your physical, okay, um, it is it comes under the law of trespass. Huh? It does not come under the law of privacy because we do not have those specific law of privacy in in Malaysia. Okay, so um, when we talk about personal data, um, uh, a, a branch of uh, the privacy itself, Okay. In Malaysia, we do have um, a personal data protection law. However, this personal data protection law only uh, covers the processing of personal data in commercial transactions. Okay, so one of the uh, obvious uh, limitation and obvious weakness of our uh, uh, PDPA is about uh, the the scope of its application eh, whereby it's only apply or it's only applicable to commercial transaction so um maybe the issue uh, about uh, how about if uh, the uh, the data is uh, shared okay, uh, to social media eh? so, so we have a lot of uh, social media mediums uh, uh, nowadays, uh, we have uh, Facebook, Instagram, and whatnot. Okay, so uh, um, it is still um, it is still not clear, right? and and uh, from the uh, limit uh, from the scope of data protection itself, it seems that um, the processing of data that is beside uh, uh, um, or, or other than commercial transaction, okay. It's not covered by it's not covered by the uh, PDPA. Okay, so um, so apart from uh, person uh, personal data just now, we also have uh, the protection of sensitive uh, sensitive data. Okay, uh, it, it relates to the when the data is about uh, race, religion, health, politi political opinion, offense record. Okay, uh, this will become under the protection of. Um, um, PDPA. Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, I think um, uh, we we need to uh, go into the into the history of why PDPA is is introduced. Okay. In uh, two thousand, uh, the PDPA two thousand ten, but it's enforced in uh, fifteen November tw twenty thirteen. Okay, the primary objective is to regulate the processing of personal data of individual involved in a commercial transaction. So it state clear, it state clearly there it is only for commercial transactions. Okay, and um, um, 
in providing those kind of protection, they provide uh, protective measures to safeguard private and, of, and personal data of the consumers and individuals. And those measures are to promote uh, consumer confidence and prevent abuses, uh, abuse of such data in relentless global data and information market. However, you will need to bear in mind that this PDPA is actually um, uh, uh, providing uh, a kind of a punishment, uh, punishment, offense and punishment. Uh, it is not remedial in nature, meaning to say that the data subjects, it has no recourse to uh, um, to remedy uh, under law uh, uh, by virtue of this law, by virtue of, of PDPA. Okay, uh, the PDPA does not provide any remedies in terms of money, monetary compensation or whatnot for data subject okay so this is also uh, among the among the uh, uh, witnesses uh, of the pdpa right okay meaning that uh, uh, there there is no private litigation that can be brought under pdpa okay it does not provide a statutory civil right of action for breach of uh, any of the provisions of the pdpa so as a private individual especially the data subject okay you cannot uh, commence a, a civil action okay uh, to be brought under this pdpa yeah, because it is not remedial in in nature so an aggrieved individual however can still pursue a civil action under common law of thoughts okay uh, against a data user who has misused the individual personal data but how far um, those other uh, common law principles um, can adequately protect uh, the victims of, of misusing of personal data here. Okay, so that is the uh, one of the witnesses that uh, PDPA um, has. Uh, okay, so um, next maybe um, Maybe I uh, because uh, some of my notes, uh, some of uh, my explanation here has already been shared by Dr. Ani just now. Thank you very much for that. I just uh, would like to go directly to this one, okay, um, about the rights of data subject, okay, uh, the right to prevent processing for direct marketing, okay. Uh, as a data subject, you still have these rights. Uh, these rights is given to you under the uh, PDPA, okay. However, if there is any breach of uh, this particular right or, or denial of this of uh, of the rights, okay, only the punishment or or it will be considered as an offense under the act. However, as for you, the data subject, okay, um, we still do not have recourse uh, under civil civil law. Okay, uh, right to prevent processing for direct marketing, right to prevent processing likely to cause distress right to withdraw consent, right to make correction to the data and also right to access to the data. So although um, it's spelled out clearly in the PDPA that these are the rights um, uh, that is guaranteed eh, to the data subject, okay, in any of the situation, if there is any event of the breach or misuse, okay, um, you still cannot, uh, there is still no, um, there is no, there is still no cause of action under the PDPA itself. Okay, you need to, uh, the victim need to find other um, avenues uh, in order to bring his claim to the to the court. Okay, that is one of the obvious uh, witnesses uh, that um, uh, that uh, that is under PDPA uh, now. Okay. Okay. So uh, maybe I would like to go back to the question. Uh, by um, uh, the moderator just now, okay. Um, uh, because of our inadequacy, because of the inadequacy or insufficiencies of our law, okay. Um, what are the uh, or, or what kind of uh, uh, lessons that we can have uh, from other jurisdiction? Okay, so as we know, the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, uh, is an EU law with mandatory rules for how organizations and companies must use personal data in an integrity-friendly way. 
Okay, so um, personal data means any information which directly or indirectly could identify a living person. So in, uh, in the U EU, they have a very um, so-called comprehensive uh, uh, data protection. Um, and uh, uh, they are they have a legal basis, okay, legal basis uh, for the application of these uh, data protection uh, principles. Okay, so Article Six of this um, GDPR, okay, um, highlights about the uh, uh, what are the legal basis for the lawful use of personal data. Okay, um, so one of them is the consent. Okay, consent is the most important part of the um, uh, requirement here. Okay, for the uh, use for the lawful use of personal data, they must be consent for one or more specific purposes. Okay, so um, uh, the lawful use of the data also must be necessary to fulfill a contract or to prepare a contract, necessary to fulfill an obligation by law. Okay, necessary to protect vital interest in the registered or another individual and necessary to perform a task of general interest or as part of the exercise of authority by a person responsible for personal data and also necessary for the purpose of the legitimate interest pursued by the controller or by the third, third party. So uh, under the JDPR, okay, um, before any data can be processed, or can be used okay um these are the legal basis that need to be need to be uh, considered uh, before um such processing of personal data can be can be done okay okay um if we refer to the comparative study okay um, um those are the countries okay bottom five non-eu Okay, um, uh, this comparative study is actually a study to measure um, uh, the kind of uh, protection, uh, data protection that each of the countries have. Okay, so they have five scale, okay, five scale of um, um, uh, data protection measures. And then uh, these five non-EU countries, okay, have this score. Okay, for example, China here have... Um, 1.8 so it means extensive surveillance okay meaning that uh, the, the data protection law um, in china is not workable okay so in russia 2.1 okay system systemic failure to maintain safeguards okay maybe the safeguard is there but uh, they have uh, they encountered failures eh, in order to maintain the safeguards okay and uh, also for india 2.4 2.6 for Thailand and uh, same with Malaysia, same uh, some safeguards but weakened protections. Okay, so uh, it's clearly evidence from the data protection law uh, PDPA that we have. Uh, same safe, uh, some safeguards are there, but um, in terms of protection, uh, it is not it is not thoroughly or or uh, comprehensively. Okay. Uh, doctor, and this sorry is... for the interruption. You have around a minute to wrap up everything. Okay, all right. So uh, this is the uh, five EU countries, the top five EU countries. Okay, we can say that uh, the countries like Ireland, uh, France, Portugal, they have adequate safeguards. Huh? These are the countries who uh, which adopt uh, GDPR. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, what are the uh, the lessons that we can learn from other jurisdiction? Okay, uh, in South Africa, for example, privacy rights are protected through constitutional court. Okay, so uh, we are actually towards there uh, in Sivarasa's case. Okay, uh, whereby the court tried to um, giving the the definition of personal liberty to include right of privacy. Okay, however, um, uh, the case has stopped there, has not been pursued. Eh? So, uh, still in Malaysia, uh, the right, the privacy right is not considered as constitutional rights. Okay, uh, in Argentina, for example, they actively trying to improve data privacy and keep up with other laws. Okay. Uh, in Canada, for example, they have uh, 28 different statutes protecting data privacy in the private, public and health sectors and adequate safeguards for areas of surveillance and workplace monitoring. And 
lastly in uh, new zealand uh, new zealand actually they have already privacy act 1993 however it has been um the act has been repealed and now they introduced the new one uh, privacy act 2020 and it is said to be one of the uh, most comprehensive uh, uh, data protection law uh, that we have so far Okay, so I hope uh, I will have the opportunity to um, uh, to share with you uh, um, um, later on. Okay, about what are the the essentials uh, that uh, Privacy Act 2020 New Zealand have. Okay, so this is the way forward for our PDPA. Okay, maybe we we need to widen the applicability of the act to include processing of personal data outside Malaysia. Maybe um, uh, we need to revise the PDPA to remove the exclusion of federal and state governments okay, from the applicability of the act. And the act also must apply to commercial and non-commercial transactions and also uh, to make it mandatory yeah, to report any data breach incidents. Okay. So those are the uh, the way forward for our data protection law in Malaysia. Okay, so with that, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zuyati, for such insightful sharing session. And like just what mentioning by Dr. Zuyati, we can see that actually PDPA contains several weakness in the sense of its scope is quite narrow. Uh, it's mainly covered only the, in the sense of commercial transaction and it's said to be not that comprehensive. And for sure, we're looking forward for a better development within the PDP, uh, PDPA Act itself so it's able to secure the citizens' privacy more efficiently in various aspects, not only commercial transaction. So thank you so much once again, Dr. Zuati. Uh, without further delay, now, uh, now let us hear from our third panelist, Mr. Damin. So please welcome Mr. Damin. Hi, good evening everyone. Good evening. Uh, is the audio okay? Yeah, it's very clear. All right, uh, thanks to the moderator and uh, fellow panelists and uh, everyone that's here. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that there are so many people uh, looking into this issue. Uh, so today... Uh, uh, Mr. Areas... Damin? Yeah. yeah. We know that you establish yourself as an expert in technology law. And we would like to ask Mr. Damien, as we can observe, the well-known social media such as the Facebook, TikTok and WeChat has been suspected of misusing the personal data of users. So, uh, Mr. Damien, we would like to comment on these cases or pertaining to the breach of personal data. And also, in your personal view, Mr. Damien, how can our personal data be deprived from social media? And as a user like us, what shall we be alert? while having a social media account. So yeah, Mr. Damien, would you like us to enlighten us on this issue? Sure. Um, okay, so the, the three cases that you sort of referred to there, uh, Facebook's Cambridge Analytica, uh, TikToks and WeChat. Now, although to a large extent, they fall under this big category of social media, WeChat being on the fringe side of it because it's an all-encompassing app really, uh, if, if you really look at it, the issues in each of these uh, the so-called scandals or uh, cases are, are quite different. So uh, in Facebook's Cambridge Analytica scandal, it was a situation where they were using uh, data that was collected through a third-party app uh, and consent had been given for that app. Right, and, and this is the, the real issue. I think uh, the both first and second panelists touched on this issue of co uh, consent. Uh, actually, Dr. Zuyaki was uh, focusing a bit more on that. And informed consent is one of those sort of uh, key tenets of almost any form of data protection legislation that's there. But this is a clear example as to whether or not consent uh, is worthwhile having even in different privacy policies or as this anchor form in, in legislation. Because what happens is you take consent for one app, one particular function, and very soon after that, it is used for a completely different function. So it was taken, uh, in this case, by certain uh, immediate uh, users in, in, in the app uh, that was collected for, and then it was transmitted uh, through different uh, portals and collected further. And I think the total number of users' information that was collected was, I think, about 87 million. It's a huge number of users in that case, which is what triggered the whole big question. So that's one aspect of it, the size of the user base that it was collected from. But then on the other hand, 
it was the, the nature of the use that was a big question. What did they use it for? It was taken and it was used in a political scenario. It was used to pursue, uh, to profile people and target certain specific advertisements using Facebook uh, in order to get them to vote one way or another. And this was, of course, used in the US. Now, while the focus was in the US, there were other political tones that were coming up. There was questions of influence coming in from Russia. Uh, there were questions of influence by other third parties and inappropriate use of a platform, namely Facebook. But underlying all this is the business model of Facebook itself. Now, all of us, we were talking about how data is used in, in, in very uh, many different ways. And in uh, the last two segments, I think you were pointed in the correct direction of the kind of laws that we have. But now looking at these scenarios of what Facebook did, uh, there are a lot of questions as to whether or not the laws cover all these issues and whether they can. Because beyond the law is the issue of ethics, whether you should be doing something or you shouldn't. And in, in this situation, the, the big question that comes up is, is profiling something that should be carried out? Now, Facebook, the way that it does it is, it collects all the information that it has on you as an individual, the things that you watch, the things that you stream, uh, the businesses that you engage with, uh, the people that you match with, all of that is done and it creates a profile of you as an individual. Now, the, Facebook is not the only one that does it. Uh, Amazon has outright said that it's a recommendation tool rather than being a platform for selling things. So it specializes in profiling you into a, a sort of a box. And now that I know what your profile is, I target certain specific advertisements at you. Right? And I do that because I know that maybe supposedly this is your interest. But this leads to another sort of situation, which is known in practice as nudging. And nudging is very simple. Uh, if I want you to eat cake, I will put all sorts of things in a particular format that will entice you to eat cake. And if I wanted you to eat apples, I do the same thing to nudge you in the direction to go towards apples. And that's a very simplistic use of nudging. It's been around for a while now, but it's starting to be used openly. For example, uh, in Denmark, the government of Denmark uses nudging uh, to push its citizens to do things that are positive, healthy eating, uh, adhering to road regulations. So you can use it positively. But the majority of social media uh, and marketing businesses use it in a negative sense. And the way that they use it is by creating a profile of an individual and bombarding them with all so sorts of uh, information that can be very dangerous. Right? Now, other than looking at, at uh, nudging in itself, targeted marketing is a big question. Because targeted marketing has evolved over time. Where we started out in the past by looking at advertisements in newspapers, it then evolved to billboards on the road, where we just you know, see it as we drive by. And now, every single second when you open your device, you see an advertisement for something. Any app that you open, there's an advertisement there, pushing you in one direction or the other. And sometimes, you don't really know that you're being nudged or pushed. So they, these were some of the issues that you know, came to light while Facebook's uh, Cambridge uh, Analytica scandal was coming, uh, it, it was unraveling over time. Uh, and many people started to ask all sorts of questions, everything from consent to profiling to use, political use. Uh, and these were the issues that were coming up. And to be fair, none of these were fully resolved. One of the big outcomes uh, that came out of it was a financial consideration. Facebook was fined a whooping $5 billion uh, by the FTC. Now, it, that was the largest. It was 20 times larger than any kind of uh, data breach uh, fine in the world at the time. Now, is that sufficient? Right? Is that sufficient? Are we moving in the right direction? Now, you look at TikTok, the other case that you brought up. Now, TikTok has a completely different form of scandal. It's about moving of data, collection of data and moving of data from one country to another country and both countries are at loggerheads with one another. TikTok is predominantly, well, it's HQ and uh, base of country is China. It collects information and uh, users from around the world, everywhere from India to here to US and even within China. Now, China's approach to data protection is very different from uh, the rest of the world. 
it has been increasing in its use of uh, increase in, in its legislative approach to data protection but at the same time they are very very clear that they will surveil people they will uh, conduct surveillance activities on citizens anyone present within the state all right and and they are very open about that because that is the direction of the country whereas in the west it's a completely different picture because you have the laws of privacy that the, 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 your first two panelists were talking about, your laws of privacy, GDPR, that's there. Even in the US, you have other forms of uh, protections, many forms of protections that are there. And the philosophy of privacy is very different. You have the right of privacy. Whereas in China, it's not that you don't have it. You have a different mode, a different, uh, a, a different makeup of privacy. And imposing, and it, it, to my mind, imposing the philosophies of the West onto China may not be the right thing. Uh, it, it has to be looked at in the context of culture. Very simply put, look at our PDPA. It was rightly pointed out just now that our PDPA came about because of consumer protection, business modes. It was a knee-jerk reaction. We were the first country in the region to introduce the PDPA, but we are one of the slowest in an enforcement. I think our fourth panelist sh uh, shared a link just now. Ranking Malaysia as the fifth worst non-EU country in terms of uh, BDP uh, data protection uh, uh, legislation. And if you look at it, the ranking system, it, it's, a bit, it's a big question. It's all up in the air at the moment. Whose culture, whose standards do we follow? Now, TikTok is applicable world, worldwide. And you see these different standards that they're using in, in two key areas. One, whether or not it's correct for them to be using the data that they're collecting in the first place for profiling. And you see this in one of the cases that was brought up in the US, uh, this lady by the name of uh, Misty Hong. She has actually sued uh, TikTok because she didn't create an account, but it, an account was created for her. She then continued to use the account on certain uh, limited privacy settings, but automatically those privacy settings were changed by TikTok. So she's suing them on the basis that she never intended to uh, give the data, but TikTok is behind the scenes collecting the data that it's not telling people about. Now, TikTok has had a whole rap over the past year or so of very bad press, particularly because TikTok is used heavily by minors, children, people below the age of 18. And because of that, TikTok has uh, lots of questions have come up as to the rights of children in terms of privacy. Now, to point out for you the big difference, you were talking about Malaysia. Uh, as we know, we don't have a standalone right of privacy uh, in terms of legislation, but we also do not have specific uh, legislation that protect children in terms of privacy. Now, this is an area that I'm particularly passionate about uh, and I've uh, delivered lectures on this. We don't often look at child privacy rights and we really should be because even in the US, which has one of the oldest modes of uh, child digital privacy in the form of a piece of legislation known as COPPA. COPPA was created before social media was created, yet they're still using the same legislation. And that's sort of one of the things, uh, the, the angles that the US is looking at for safeguarding. And even there they find that that's insufficient. Whereas here we do not have uh, a single standalone form of uh, legislation for children. Now TikTok, what has it done? To try and get better rep, it has joined an, an NGO. The NGO is called uh, Family Online, the Family Online Safety Institute. And it's a member there and it's trying to promote uh, the fact that it now is child friendly or it's looking towards the, the rights of children. But there are things that stand out. These big companies that we're looking at, look, look, look at TikTok, for example. They go here and they join this NGO and they try and create this impression that they care about children. but when you really look at the last post of TikTok, they put up these 10 guidance, uh, a 10 point guidance for parents, how to protect your child in terms of TikTok. And one of those points is to turn your profile setting from a child's profile setting from public to private, because it's automatically set on public. Now, the question you should be thinking about is, why does TikTok automatically set the profile to public when you know that it's a child on that system? Shouldn't it be by default set on private and then move to public? If you're really thinking about the interest of the child, that's what you do. But that competes with their business model. And that's why 
they are really not the entity that should be looking, uh, that we should be trusting with accountability, which leads me to these two last points that I want to, to highlight to you before we leave. One is the real question we should be looking at here at this current day and age in terms of privacy is the question of accountability. You look at Facebook and you look at TikTok and you look at WeChat and all the other large entities. What we're actually doing is we are trusting them to do the right thing. But they have no, they, they have not shown in history that they are, they can be trusted because they start off by an, uh, an underlying basis that they are a business and they need to make money. That's their primary goal. That is the definition of a company in law. So because they have that as their primary goal, they will never think about the, the, the issues of ethics. They will never think about the issues of accountability as a primary consideration. They will start doing it as a sort of a PR stunt. And we see that in some of the other larger uh, organizations. Google is a very good example of this. You know, repeatedly firing their uh, ethics team, moving people in and out, uh, people leaving of their own accord because they are not upholding standards, which we think they should be. All right. And very closely tied into this issue of accountability is who is auditing this whole system, right? Other than the legislation that's there, for example, Facebook in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, they were asked uh, to have an audit. And the auditor that went in was PwC, top four auditors in the world. And the PwC determined that even after this whole fiasco had happened, that the social media, uh, this huge giant in social media uh, that was shown to be using data uh, in an improper manner was actually above board. PwC says it was above board, right? And they had all sufficient internal controls necessary. So who's monitoring PwC? Who is allowing them to, to set out the terms, the standards? How are we going about checking on these systems? And the biggest problem is the only person that we really should be trusting to check are the people who are in power, who are the government. And in all these scandals that you see, Facebook leased out their information, sold their information to people in the political sphere, to governments. TikTok has been accused of moving information across the world from the US, from India, from all over the place to China for surveillance, the Chinese government. These are the accusations that are being made. Even in WeChat, the scandal that was tied in was to the government. All of this ties into surveillance and surveillance is very often carried out by the government. So what we need, there are no solutions I'm providing here right now, but we need to have an open conversation as to how are we going to regulate? How are we going to create systems of accountability when it comes to privacy? Because privacy is no longer a standalone issue. We have numerous issues tied into it. One of the questions that you ask, artificial intelligence, been around since 1956. During the game, you're asking this question. It has evolved so fast in these last few years. All of it tied in to issues of privacy. Facial recognition, to which Malaysia has been pointed out that we have very few safeguards, huge issue of privacy. All of these systems ties into, tie, tie into privacy, and we need to start thinking about these systems holistically, rather than segmenting them into smaller issues. So with that, I will leave it to questions. Thank you very much, moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Damien. Uh, like, gain a lot of things. And we, we have to understand that media, social media platforms like Facebook, WeChat, they shouldn't put aside the accountability as well as ethics, which is so significant. And something I've mentioned by Mr. Mr. Damien uh, that grabbed my attention, even though, uh, even though for children, their privacy or even though their interest shouldn't be neglected. So thank you so much, Mr. Damien. So uh, I can see over here at the chat box, Mr. Jin is so excited discussing about our topics with others two panelists today. So without further ado, before that friendly reminder here, participants, you may drop down any questions to the speaker at the chat box and those questions will be asked during the question and answer session. So without further ado, uh, without further ado, we would like to invite Mr. John to further commenting on our topic today. Let's welcome Mr. John. Hi everyone. Good evening. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Yeah. Hola, Mr. John. I hope I did pronounce it correctly. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. I typically go by John. How's the 
quality level of my audio. Is it okay? Yeah, sure. So, um, Mr. John, we are so glad to have you to be with us today. And thank you so much for spending your time for sharing your knowledge with us tonight. So, uh, Mr. John, we would like to ask you, actually, how do we ensure our conversation through uh, the social media not being viewed by the tech companies? Second, I would like to ask uh, Mr. John, how do we confirm that the emails, spam filters are being correctly detected? And how we ensure our own human rights being protected of the internet? And Mr. John, last but not least, based, your, uh, based on your own experiences and views, do you have any great solutions or idea bring forward for consideration on this issue? So let's welcome Mr. John. Hi, so I understand that from what you have on the screen right now, uh, the questions are the last three points. Well, like I said, um... Yes, exactly. Ah, so those are rather... Not straightforward um, answers to um, to give. Hmm. Let me read them again a little bit. I want to make sure that I understand exactly what you're trying to say. Unlike deterministic algorithms, machine learning algorithms calibrate themselves, correct? Uh, partially correct, yes. Because they divide so many patterns, they are too complex for humans to understand, and thus impossible to trace the decision recommended make. Well, I would counter argue a little bit that um, first things first, I. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of demystifying things. Um, let's remind ourselves that AI is nothing but software. More sophisticated software, but it is software in the end, okay? So when, when we say that we can't follow what they are trying to generate or what are their internal processes, that is only true to the extent that we don't have enough re resources to actually being able to investigate all the potential logs that you might be generating in that particular uh, uh, internal process. I mean, can we have a trace of all the internal operations that an AI software is performing? Sure. The problem would be that investing time to try to analyze all of that would be just absolutely ridiculous. And, and, and practically, in practicality, it would be pointless. And therefore, we just consider that the black box. Um, so it, it's a matter of resources more than, more than anything. Um, um, what are the consequences of that? Well, the consequences is that sometimes we're just flipping a coin. And we're just hoping that our evaluation of the inputs verify to the outputs and making sure that they more or less um, um, correspond to what was our initial expectation uh, that is going to be um, accurate. However, we know very well that you always have false positives and false negatives depending on what is it that you're trying to, to obtain. So um, um, given the current circumstances, a deterministic answer would be extremely complex and very, very risky to provide. I would not dare myself uh, to, to give a 100% uh, assurance that a specific AI algorithm is going to be as accurate as you want. Um, error rates. Well, I would believe that that pretty much answers your question there. Um, solution to bring forward consideration on the issues. Well, I'm going to try to be tackling this during during my presentation, uh, so I don't want to reveal much. But let's say that the, the the main problem that we are facing when it comes to all of this is that we keep looking at it from a policy perspective, whereas the problem is actually a technical in in, in nature. Um, we keep looking at um, how to remedy the possible impact of those technologies and how to implement um, privacy and human rights into into the technology. And the problem that we have is that we are trying to we are trying to turn qualitative concepts into quantitative systems. And that is always going to be prone to, pro to problems. Um, we, we say in, in Spanish that, you know, uh, make the rule, make the trap, where, whereby basically um, if you start having a system to measure a particular scenario, you can already decide how you're going to be cheating the system because now you know how to avoid those particular measures or how to tilt it towards your own interests. Um, the same happens when it comes to, to all of these, these concepts. Mm, the main reason why we have right now the problem that we are, that we find ourselves into is because the regulations have created a situation where the burden of observance, it's in the shoulders of the final user. And that's pretty much preposterous. Um, you wouldn't expect a user to feel responsible if their car was not provided, it was not delivered into the market uh, under a specific certification that tells you very, very clearly that it's safe for you and safe for third people. Um, there is a, um, 
Let me use the example of a, of, of a seat belt, for instance. So a government wouldn't tell you only, oh, um, cars must have seat belts and seat belts must, must be saving lives. That is the actual assumption. But on top of that, they will tell you, well, for a seat belt to be considered legally uh, 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 legal, these are the technical requirements. These are the tests that you have to go through. And if you don't pass them, your car doesn't get into the market. And everyone knows which game we are playing because they do have those technical standards to follow. Now, if you look into this when it comes to GDPR, GDPR is a fantastic conversation starter. It still, however, fails because it doesn't provide as a technical standard for implementation. And so if you provide GDPR to 25 different teams of developers to do, let's say, an HR management platform, they will implement their own GDPR compliance in 25 different ways. Good, good luck trying to have a way to standardize compliance, verification of compliance. And you also don't have an agency that is doing that. Whereas for basically any other industry that you can think of, there is an industry behind, there's an agency that basically checks that. You can even have that uh, if you look at hardware for smartphones. MCMC provides their own certification from a technical perspective. So if you want to sell a, a smartphone in the, in the Malaysian market, you have to provide them first with a prototype. It will go through numbers of checks and, and, and verifications. And unless you pass them, there's no way for you to sell the product. And those technical specifications are, are very um, um, reasonable. I mean, they are along the lines of let's make sure that the battery doesn't explode on your face. Of course, they also comply with other things such as, you know, respecting the, the, um, the jurisdictional um, uh, communication spectrum and so forth. But that, that's another story. Let's not get into those details. Now, um, you don't, you have an agency, which is MCMC, who's going to be verifying that compliance and puts a sticker. You don't get the sticker, you don't get into the market. Now, which agency anywhere in the world is actually verifying public software, public consumption software? Not a single one. And therefore, you come from the assumption that at this point, the final user has to be nothing short of a hacker. They need to understand the devices, they need to understand how to configure them, they need to understand what's malware, they need to understand what's, hello, what's data protection, what is the data? I mean, even the technical community, there is no consensus of what is the nature of data. You're expecting a user to actually also understand that? That's preposterous. What we need to do is to start shifting the conversation a little bit and inviting the right people, which are basically technologists, and making sure that we provide them with ways to stand up in a, in a standard way to implement technologies by design so that users can be removed from the, from the equation and stop removing all of that extra pressure that they have and provide them with systems that essentially protect them by design. And, and, and this is not, I mean, uh, it's one of the reasons I was mentioning before in, in, in the chat, if I have the chance later, um, but there is a huge comparison. I mean, the problem with governments is that they are providing policies, but they are, not, they are not closing the loop by not providing an infrastructure to enforce the policy. That's, that's pretty much how it summarizes. And, and whoever thinks that that would be kind of a utopian situation, you only have to think that corporations are already doing that. So Apple provides you um, um, digital assets that you can download based on a specific licensing system. Always remember that you don't buy songs anymore, you buy a license on the song. You can install it in, your, in a in number of your devices. You can even share with some of the members of your families, depending on what is the business model that they want to, to implement. Now, if Apple tomorrow decides to remove one of those um, um, digital assets, what happens? Two things. One, you have no recourse. Second, that asset is going to, I assure you, is going to disappear from all of your devices. What they are doing is they control the policy, aka business model, and they control the infrastructure to enforce it. And that is basically where governments are, are failing. So thank you so much, Mr. John. Would like to uh, enlighten us more pertaining on your lecturing today, or you want to present us with more information that you have been prepared for today? Sure. Um, because we still have uh, quite a, uh, plenty of time for your session. Yeah, Thank let you, me Mr. just John. share my, my screen. I'm going to find my presentation. Sure. Let me just give me a second. It was prepared here, but for some reason it's not showing on my... Why is it not showing here? Hmm. This is interesting. For some reason it's not showing in the options for me to share. Uh, Mr. John, over yes. the down, there's a bar beside the uh, video. There's a share option for you to share. Then you will choose which tab you would like to share. 
Yes, the option was there. What's, what was not showing was the particular screen that I wanted to share. I think it is now coming. Yeah, yeah, it, it's working now. Okay, All right. Thank you, Mr. John. Okay. So allow me to introduce myself. My name is um, um, Jean-Francois. I, I go by John, makes it easier for everybody. Um, I manage an organization called the IO Foundation. Uh, we are an NGO uh, advocating for data-centric data -centric, um, digital rights. Now, the topic of today and the question that we've been trying to, to solve is um, whether it is safe for you to share all of your confidential information. Well, I have a very simple answer to that. The answer is no, it isn't. And in fact, I'm going to be reaffirming that double nope. It is not at all at the moment safe for you to share your confidential information. But before we, we, we get into, into analyzing a little bit that, I want I felt that the, the question was interesting on, on, on itself. So I wanted to, to think a little bit on, on the keywords that you used in, in, your, in your question. And I, I think they're pretty relevant. So is it safe? So first we would need to understand what do we mean by safe? For you to share all, I think that's also quite a, a critical term because you didn't say some, you say all. Your confidential information, um, the, the, the stress on confidential should already tell you that the answer is no, because there's a reason why it's confidential. There is a reason why we're using that term. It's not just any information about you, it's what you consider confidential. And that already comes with a number of consequences from a societal perspective. So um, um, there are reasons why we talk constantly about privacy. It's because we do have this category of information, which is not always very clear to us, sort of an abstract concept at, at, at times, about what is it that we consider private. But definitely a confidential information would be considered that. And there's, there's, there's a very concerning growing um, lack of, uh, of interest towards protecting privacy, specifically on, 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 on the big masses. I mean, we could go for hours about why this is happening. But essentially, you will have a, a kind of a movement saying that, well, I, I, don't, I don't care about my privacy. Uh, I don't care about sharing my data because I have nothing to hide. Well, if that's uh, sorry for interruption, yeah. Mr. John, can yes. you please minimize the tap because there's a there's a window like trying to block the slide. Is it? Yeah, is it, this um, one. yeah exactly this one. Oh, it it has to be there. Thing? Can you try to minimize it? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, okay. Mr. John. Okay, interesting. That was the the presenter uh, screen shouldn't be showing, but okay, doesn't matter. Um, so as I was um mentioning, um. Whoever believes that they have nothing to um, to share, I, I will invite you. I will invite them to to give me details about their personal sexual life or to give me their um, debit card pin number, and we can have this conversation again. Um, there's always something that we cannot share for whatever reason. It depends on the country, it depends on society, it depends on whichever context. But there is information that we we are very very careful to share all at all given times, and 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 we shouldn't be as naive as to think that uh, that doesn't happen. So let's let's have a look a, a little bit as well, because you were talking about, about uh, data and information, and, and there's, there's a number of interesting parallelisms to, to compare between um, um, our physical uh, reality and, and, and digital systems. So um, the first thing is outreach, or you prefer rich. Um, when we expand information, where we share information um, in, 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 um, in, in the physical realm, basically our reach is one-to-one, one, one to the masses, as in what's the maximum that you can talk with your voice? It's as, as far as your voice can be loud, uh, you can reach what about 200 people because you are in a, in a closed space. That's about as far as you can go. The moment that you start using even a microphone, you're already getting into the domain of the digital. Okay? And the domain of the digital, what really allows you is to amplify that. And so any information that you might be passing gets automatically or potentially amplified in its outreach in how many people it can reach or how many people can access it the moment that you enter into the domain of the, of the digital. The next one is agency. And this has some very interesting um, differences. So um, when, I, when I share data or information about myself, whether it is confidential or not with, with someone else, that information basically gets into their brain. Um, the moment that that is done, 
there is no practical situation right now, not that we have discovered yet at, at least, where I can recover agency over that data. It's gone forever. And so, of course, you, you can always have this parallelism about um, forgiveness, uh, forgetfulness. I mean, someone can forget the information, but I can't tell a friend of mine, hey, I want you to forget, I want you to erase a secret that you know about me right now. That's not going to happen. It's not easy to do. Okay. Uh, whereas when you are in, 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 in a technological um, 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 environment, milieu, um, depending on how you architect the systems, you could have that reassurance of agency, and you could um, theoretically, again, it depends on how things are implemented, um, be able to delete that information without quote unquote traces. That's another story. Let's not get into, in, into that. Um, the possibility of, uh, of forgetting the data exists and and the extraction of it will be in the case of the physicality how strong in character the person that knows your secret knows your data is and when it comes to technology it will depend on how the system has been architected and those are again two very different um, approaches on itself but 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 it's important to understand that there's there's a huge um divergence between how data is, is managed from a physical perspective and how it is from a digital perspective. And finally, representation. Um, what do I mean by this is that information, in order to be able to be processed by whoever, any endpoint that is going to be managing the information requires to understand what is how the data has been represented. We typically take for granted uh, every time that we speak uh, among each other, for instance, in, in, in a physical world, uh, but we are all exercising the fact that we are all agreeing into a set of, of definitions for a specific language, and therefore I can understand each other almost in a real time. Okay. Um, the only thing that I need, for instance, uh, uh, and there's many ways to do it from a, from a physical perspective, but the, the simplest one for me to be able to pass uh, information that I don't want others to necessarily understand is to just shift a, a language. And if I speak to you, for instance, uh, uh, in, in French, and you are the only person in this in this audience that understands French. Well, I'm passing the, the information, quote unquote, in a safe manner. Okay. Uh, there will be the need for, uh, for for anyone to understand how to decipher or to how to understand the language in order to be able to interpret the data. And the same happens when it comes to um, to digital systems, in where the um, what really matters is how the information has been encoded in a language that only the two endpoints or the endpoints participating in communication can understand. Typically, you would call that encryption. All right, uh, and the reason why you can uh, defeat an encryption is because all of a sudden you are giving the tools to be able to interpret the data and transform it in a way that becomes intelligible for you. All right, now there's one important part here that we've been sort of tackling around during the whole session, and and it 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 sort of becomes critical when you think about how you're going to be able to try to tackle with this from a technical perspective. Let's, let's be clear, information is not a problem. Even confidential information is not the problem. The problem is what we do with it. Okay, let's put this example. So you and I, for instance, um, share a secret of a third party, a friend of us, an acquaintance. It's not because we know that secret that that acquaintance is in, is in any danger. It's how we decide to act upon that information whether we're going to be putting that person in danger or not. All right. So for as long as the information is treated properly, you are not necessarily endangering anybody. And, and in fact, that is exactly what happens when, uh, for instance, I uh, introduce my critical number uh, uh, online to be able to do a purchase. If only those two people involved have access to that information, so that the, the endpoint of the merchant and, and myself and nobody else can have access to it. For if the merchant is implementing the system properly in the way we communicate, there is no, no reason for me to be to be concerned because it's going to be extremely difficult, not impossible. It's going to be very, uh, very difficult for information to be obtained by a third party. OK, now this is very important when it comes to deciding at the level of algorithms. Because it's not about the data, you're going to always going to need data. There's no way that you can live a life that is based on informed decisions if you don't have data to be able to support them, even if it is confidential, even if it is critical inf information. Let me put you, put you a very simple example. Uh, Malaysia is one of those uh, few governments that I know of that provides um, treatment for life for HIV-positive um, citizens. 
you have can, you can have access to antiretrovirals if you follow a certain procedure. Um, as a government, I, I need to know where is the distribution of my citizens, which are HIV positive, so I can stock the proper hospitals to provide them with uh, with that service. That is confidential information. I mean, I can't go around and disclose who is HIV positive, but it is required for me to be able to, to, be, to make my planning. So again, it's not about the data itself, which is going to be very necessary at some point to make some decisions. It's how that information is treated, who has access to it, how it is, how the accountability is, is established upon it, and what's the algorithm that you are applying in, into it. And let's not kid it ourselves. When we make a decision ourselves in, 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 as, a, as a person, we are also applying algorithms of decision. So the concept really applies to, to, to both universes. Now, so what is the situation at the moment? Well, as I was mentioning before, we are working on this, this premise that is an absolute fallacy, which is all of you have to be super hackers. You need to understand everything about technology. You need to understand everything about data protection laws. You need to know how to apply them. You need to know what's a data breach. You need to know how to protect your devices, blah, 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 blah. And so what we do is we keep having all of these trainings on cybersecurity, on digital hygiene. Well, this is equivalent as expecting every single citizen, every time they go to a public space, a public building, to get a master's degree on how that building was built, what were the safety measures that were implemented, and to make sure that everything is fine before stepping in. Repeat next time you get into another public building. That is ludicrous. It's absolutely ridiculous, and you will never expect that from any single industry. You don't go out from your house with a test kit checking that your TOI's limao is actually potable every time you are in a minimum mama. That is not your assumption. Your assumption is the government is providing rules to make sure that buildings don't collapse and that the water is potable. That's it. And as far as it concerns you, your responsibility is when you get water from the tap, it doesn't smell and your, and your glass is, is, uh, is clean. That's about it. However, what we are expecting is people to understand exactly how to do all the tests and how to, how to verify that the water can be drinkable. And that is just not going to happen. It's a reason why people are so saturated and they don't feel like checking any of this stuff. So we need to change a little bit the, the, the narrative. We need to shift the responsibility and to make sure that we are providing them with things that are protected by design. So what was it that, that, that we propose? What is it that, that we have been working in, in the other foundation in, in uh, very particularly? on the concept that the next generation of human rights and digital rights defenders are programmers. Technologists at large, of course, uh, but we prefer to, to, to um, uh, we have decided in, in TIOF to concentrate on programmers specifically because they are the ones who implement the interface, the last interaction step between you and the devices. So anything that the device can do in, in reality is the software that is gonna be determining those options for the final user. Um, and, and we don't believe that they have been properly invited to the to the table so far. We don't believe that the educational pipeline is providing with any of the tools that they require in order to be able to, to fulfill their obligations and to develop a sense of responsibility. Um, you tell me how many computer science uh, uh, graduates um, have any course on human rights or digital rights across their university time. I mean, that's not happening. You have you know, all of these concepts of, uh, of ethics and, and so forth, which are very, very pretty. Uh, the problem with ethics is that they are typically culturally attached. And so whatever concept of ethics are, let's say, taught in the US may not be applying in Asia. There's, there's an attempt of trying to find universal ethics systems behind it, but that's still very, very difficult. It's, it's, not, it's not a straightforward thing. And, uh, and plus, it doesn't matter that you have a, 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 a guideline as to how to behave from an ethical perspective from a technical um, um, environment if you're not providing all the tools and you know, all the um, systems for programmers to start taking their place as uh, actual agents of change the, into the whole situation. So we've been thinking quite hard um, in, into this. One of the reasons why the IO Foundation was, was created uh, and we've been putting together a number of, of principles to, to try to, to establish a little bit, uh, or to guide a little bit the, um, the conversation. And we've got three of them. Uh, the first one is I am my data. I am my data is essentially the reflection upon, there is no such thing as data that is not linked to you. As uh, uh, Mr. Amin was mentioning before, all of this profiling uh, that is done by, by companies. Um, only data that is fully contextualized has any value. If I tell you number five, number five means nothing to anybody. 
I need to start providing you about certain context to understand what is it that I'm referring with that particular number. And the moment that you do so, you're essentially linking that data point to a specific source entity that has generated it. And you can't sever that connection anymore, lest you want to again lose the context of the data and therefore lose all, all value. And of course, it can be partially decontextualized and still remain survived, but let's, let's not get into those details. Now, this really intricate connection between you and, and your data has very interesting consequences. So one of the questions that we pose is the following. If, if under um, jurisdictions that have a constitution, well, citizens physically speaking- Mr. Physically, John. Yes. Uh, sorry for the interruption. You have around another uh, one minute to wrap our rating due to our one time minute. Okay, yeah. that's going to be very, very Thank complicated. You, Mr. John. Yeah, I'm going to try. So um, one question, if, if, um, if jurisdictions apply to me, giving me some constitutional rights, what is it that is, they are not applying also to my data? And if uh, governments have duties of care to um, set put together infrastructures in order to apply and to implement those uh, physical rights that I have, say, for instance, um, um, healthcare, they need to put together hospitals, uh, then maybe we should actually have a conversation as to whether governments should have their own cloud system to uh, host my data as a citizen and make sure that it's not being used by anybody else. Uh, principle number two, very quickly, basically, is uh, and remedy is the idea of trying to think proactively on algorithms that avoid the need for remedy to begin with. Why do I want a system of remedy if I can actually attempt to avoid the grievance uh, to begin with from the from the uh, from the beginning, so it doesn't happen, and therefore I don't need remedy. And the third one is basically a compendium of the of the last two, whereby uh, designing systems should come with the mentality of rights by design, by which any regulations that are already falling into me should be already implemented transparently to me uh, in, in technology. I'm not going to have time to actually go through this since I'm going to be sharing the, the slides later. You can have a look at the, what parallelisms we, we establish. Um, one of the things that we do very quickly in TIOF is we organize an event called uh, Take Up, which is uh, monthly, and we try to uh, provide a platform for programmers to develop the skills that they require to become uh, next generation of uh, agents of change. And in summary, answering your question, no, we cannot at the moment uh, uh, be uh, at all feel safe about sharing our information because the infrastructure and the applications are not designed in a way that is going to be transparently protective for users. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. J. Now, say, Mr. J has brought us so detailed into our topic discussed today. And um, definitely, I'm sure our participants have benefited a lot from what Mr. John had uh, delivered just now. And uh, no worries, I'm pretty sure Mr. John still have a lot of knowledge to share with us, all of us. So we shall now move on to the question and answer session. And for this session, we will try to address as many questions as possible. So, dear participants, do not hesitate to leave us any question and grab the golden opportunity if you have any doubts in regards to our issue today. So let me have a check on uh, on our chat box, any question. So just type, if you want to unmute yourself, yeah, you are most welcome to do so. Let me have a look. Go on, yeah. Uh, Here's a question uh, directed to Dr. Ani. Uh, Dr. Ani, are you here? I am. I am here. Hi, Dr. Ani. Welcome back. So, uh, uh, Dr. Ani, uh, someone asked about uh, cyber criminals are sneaky nowadays and will often compose their phishing scams to look like legitimate communications from a bank, utility company, utility or other corporate entity. So uh, may I know what are the tips for us to detect phishing scam in order to protect our personal data? Okay, <clears throat> thank, you. thank you very much uh, for that question. So uh, this is a very general question, which I believe uh, you can Google the answer. But from my own experience, I would also like to share, I, I am a person who likes to share experience, right? Rather than going through uh, my slides or uh, directing you to the website because Google is the largest library you can just go there but from my experience not only uneducated people even educated people they can fall victim to phishing uh, scams um, why because the, the system is very intelligent nowadays people are very intelligent they can do things beyond our imagination they can create a website which is 100% strikingly similar to what we thought would be it okay so having said that 
number one is definitely what I share from my own experience and my friends as well is we always make sure that we do not click on the links okay number one is because the links they can be very convincing as well okay they put it to be maybank to you.com but when in fact you hover your mouse to it you, you put your cursor to it it's not maybank to you.com for example so um, number one is definitely that and number two even if uh, you you uh, i myself i always put it as um how shall I say, a bookmark, okay? But before I go for the bookmark, I will go for uh, the original website first. Before we go to the login page of Maybank to you, we have to go to Maybank. But um, uh, other than that, okay, a very easy, very, how shall I say, um, the tips will be there, okay? But we have to be cautious all the time. Do not trust everything that you see, like you see uh, the story of criminal minds, okay? Criminal Minds is a story that you can relate uh, to things, how people think, how we would behave. So if we put ourselves into the shoes of people who would implement or would commit uh, the crime of uh, uh, causing people to do fishing or to, to, uh, to, to uh, commit fraud, okay, for example, uh, something like uh, that, that information as well, we have to be careful. Okay. I don't have any specific answers for that uh, because to me, uh, I don't memorize something that can be found online. Okay, But I really, really advise and advocate to my students, to all the participants today, as well as uh, maybe if any of the presenters can correct me if I'm wrong as well. It goes back to what we hold in our mind, okay? what we hold, our values inside of us. If you think that you are cautious, Please think again, okay? We have to be cautious all the time. I think Thank that's, that's my response to that question. Thank you, Dr. Ani. And I will say, just like mentioning by Dr. Ani, uh, cautious is the key whenever you're accessing your data to prevent you from getting trapped and kind of cyber criminal. So uh, let's look on the other question. Uh, uh, from uh, Hui Wen, may I know how can government balance the benefits of big data and personal data privacy? Uh, uh, Dr. Zuyati, would we'll like to take this question? All right. Um, thank you for the question. Okay, as we know that um, uh, the state government, uh, the the federal government and state government is not uh, uh, is not covered uh, by the uh, PDPA, meaning that the uh, the, the the government. Uh, can uh, process the personal data and then uh, uh, and then in this scenario how uh, the the big data itself it can be balanced uh, the benefit okay uh, actually the government um, uh, uh, have the justification yeah, justification uh, in uh, in processing the big data okay because of uh, national security law enforcement combating terrorism okay that's why that is the uh, the reason why um, uh, federal and state government is being excluded uh, from the purview of uh, personal data protection law. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zuati, for enlightening us uh, regarding the issue question by our participants. And we have another question asked by Xie Jing. Currently, there's a lot of places that will provide free public Wi-Fi net, uh, networks uh, such as McDonald's, KFC. So is it safe for us to connect to the free Wi-Fi network? And can others access or hack into our devices to steal our personal data when we connected to the free Wi-Fi network? Uh, perhaps we could have uh, Mr. Damin to, add that, uh, to further address this question. Welcome, uh, Mr. Damin. Um, I may not be the right person to address this. Uh, it's a technical question to see whether you can. From personal experience, yes, it can happen. Uh, I have been hacked before numerous times. Uh, that's why we always advise not to use uh, public Wi-Fi, um, especially when you're dealing with uh, systems like banking and whatnot. Uh, but I'm happy to take uh, the other question that deals with a uh, technology and data protection regulation framework. Yeah, sure, sure. Sure, go ahead. Right, so I think uh, Ko Chen has asked, uh, let, sorry, how do you keep up with the technology? Uh, which country association will have the best data protection regulation or framework? 
uh, I think it's an ongoing concern that there that legislation always finds it hard to keep up. But uh, I just want to highlight to you that you have to look at it from uh, the types of legislation. Legislation can be legislation is parliamentary drafted. It's hard and fast. There's no going around it. But that's why you have common law for interpretation of the legislation. And frankly speaking, that's not good enough either. Um, what we may want to explore, especially when it comes to uh, very new technologies, artificial intelligence included, uh, would be to look at soft laws, right? Self-regulatory models. Uh, we want to explore how the uh, how businesses are reacting to it locally before diving in and creating uh, hard law. This is why frameworks are very important. And if you notice, particularly in terms of artificial intelligence, frameworks are being developed by uh, a number of places. Uh, Vietnam has just launched theirs. Singapore has got two. Thailand has launched theirs. So these frameworks act as guidelines for institutions. Uh, and, and some of the guidelines can evolve to become codes of practice that can be enforced. If you see in other sectors, uh, the employer-employee code of conduct, uh, and not uh, immediately enforceable, but heavily recognizable uh, in industrial practice. So you have these codes that can uh, become, they have significant weight attached to it. And we hope that these frameworks can evolve into that. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Damien, on addressing uh, that issue. And we have another question. Are we encouraged to install or purchase additional protection software such as the antivirus software, anti-spyware software, and firewall? If our budget is limited, then which kind of software is most recommended and is it able to give the best protection to our personal data? I guess uh, I guess our Mr. John will be the best person to answer this question. Mr. John? Yeah, so I would like actually to take that one and the next one of the password managers. Um, the um, yeah, the sure. answer to the to firewalls and and and, and antivirus is actually the point on the, the complaint that I was making before. Users should not concern themselves with that. It should actually be implemented in a way that just protects you. End of the story. You shouldn't be concerning on where's the best firewall out there, where's the best antivirus, how does it work, how do I configure it, do I have my updates up, uh, uh, absolutely properly configured. Um, did I get connected last week and, and get the, the proper updates? It's 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 ridiculous. Um, yes, you should definitely have something running. Uh, if ever possible, you should also have um, a firewall. The problem is you need to know how to configure it. You need to know how to maintain it. And typically, those pieces of software will be running on real time while you are trying to do other things, uh, and they tend to slow down your device. It very much depends on whether you have you know, a, a, a flagship device or or not. Um, typically, people get discouraged about using them specifically on desktops and, and, on, and on laptops until maybe the past three, four years, where um, you would see a huge drain of performance and even battery just because you're trying to protect yourself. So that, that that's already a problem on itself. The, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is you shouldn't be having the responsibility to pay attention to that. And as for the password manager, absolutely yes. You need to use one. I'll be passing pasting now in the in in the in the chat the the one that I would recommend for being open source and widely used. Now, um, on the question as to you know the the the, the password that uh, the the self generated password from Apple, I would say that I don't know because I don't use Apple devices, but definitely the rule is minimum thirty two characters nowadays. Don't get any any uh, under that. Um, depending on how. The, the, the system is going to be implemented. Um, um, anything be, uh, below that can be very easy to crack nowadays. So I would not go under 32 characters and complex passwords. Okay. And of course, please use a different password for each of one of your services. That's why you want to use a password manager. So you don't have to remember them. It's kind of a safe. You have different number of keys as you have a key set, if you will, for different houses. Keep in there and make sure to not share um, any access to that to anybody. Specifically, now that we are moving into using things such as cryptocurrencies, that's going to be even more critical to make sure that no one has access to any of that information. All right, Mr. John. Mr. John, uh, perhaps you could like add on something on pertaining to the issue that is it public uh, Wi-Fi uh, trustable to be used? Uh, typically not. Um, one, because you don't know exactly which other machines are connected to that, to that network. And if you can't, if you so let me put it this way. It doesn't matter which network you're connected to. If the, if the network is insecure, 
you can be a target. And that goes with connecting with regular telcos as to a private Wi-Fi in, in a mall. It doesn't really matter. It is the equivalent as how safe are you when you get into an Uber car? Well, it very much depends on how nice the driver is and how secure it is in, in, in the way he drives. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the elements that are pretty much outside of your own, own purview. So when, when typically you would have telcos have to comply with a number of, uh, um, of, um, um, of regulations, so you can assume that, that to the best of their abilities, they are providing you with a safe environment. Now, it, it may not be the case when it comes to, um, um, to, um, to a mall. And, and one step beyond that, what does it cost you to actually get access to the network? It's not even if it's the network is secure itself. If you need to actually register yourself, give your name, your birth, your, your birth date, your email address, and so forth, in order to be have to have access to the network, you're already giving away a lot of your data. So I don't really need to try to attack your machine if you are already giving me willingly most of that data, and you actually consent through you know ten pages of a uh, of TOC that you are not even reading because you want to be able to check your latest Instagram thing without consuming your own personal data. So it, 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 it isn't just only about the security, it's also about what we accept when we get into those networks. Thank you so much, Mr. John. And I would say it's nothing 100% that can ensure the safety during accessing those kind of stuff. So uh, there's a specific question directed to uh, Mr. Damin from Li Xian. Is it true that TikTok is able to obtain our data from our device without our consent? Uh, Mr. Damin? Okay. Um, I think this is not just for TikTok. A lot of people ask these questions about Facebook and they've done tests whether Facebook is actually listening in to you uh, on your device while it's even off, all right, uh, or while the app is not even launched. Um, lots of questions about this or whether they are and whether they can. Specifically with TikTok, they collect a variety of information. Uh, it seems like the common ones are your uh, like the videos that you've watched, what you're re-watching, comments that you've made, your keyboard rhythms, your strokes, what you're typing, even your messages that you send, even the ones you don't send but you've typed out, they'll, they'll hold on to this information. Um, there have been suggestions that you might actually, uh, they might actually be able to use, and it's quite easy to do actually, uh, because these are in the form of videos, uh, facial recognition can be used to, to in, in many different ways on the videos. Uh, to analyze the videos. Now, uh, that's one of the big things about them collecting data. And the qu question was whether it can be done without your consent. It can be done without your consent. The likelihood of it being done without your consent is very low because uh, they're getting so much heat from the regulators that they are not going to collect it without your consent. That said, most people, most users of TikTok are clicking I agree very readily uh, on almost anything that they are, they are doing. So uh, it's not going to be changed uh, anytime soon. One other thing I just want to highlight about TikTok, it's not directly related to privacy, but one concern because it's based in China has been the issue of censorship. Uh, so certain messages that are sent between users, especially if that user is based in China, uh, they are automatically analyzing and not permitting certain uh, items to go across in terms of messages. So this goes into that, that area of nudging that we were talking about in terms of profiling. So they will stop certain propaganda, what they perceive to be propaganda-based messages from flowing back and forth. So you may want to take a look at that. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Damien, for such detailed explanation. And over the chat box, uh, participants, uh, our Mr. John even recommended some password manager that might be useful for you. And over here, Mr. John mentioned, for those interested, we are actually running a training session on some digital security tools in Apple on our coming tech up. I'll be sending information to Elsa UM. And for sure, we'll spread the information regarding this to the WhatsApp group. So it's we able to uh so it's beneficial to all of us. So since that uh, our time is quite near to the end of, of, of our session, I uh, will be glad if our panelists will take around one or two minutes to wrap up everything. So can we start from uh, Dr. Aini? Thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Kai Cheng, for that thank you, Dr. Aini. <clears throat> opportunity. Um, okay, uh, this is something that I have already mentioned uh, at the earlier session of my presentation, but I'm going to repeat it again because to me it is very, very important. Um, how we deliver ourselves, how we present ourselves in the online world, uh, it will actually show that uh, it is what we 
hold on to or how we believe things. Okay? So when you say good words or bad words, you share information, you don't share information, it actually falls back to the values that you hold on to. Okay? So be careful. Why? Because what you decide now to share or not to share will actually determine what will happen, what might happen to us, what we are exposing ourselves to in the future. Okay, that's it from me. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ani. And we can see that it's our freedom to share anything, our current location, even though we, we, we are at a restaurant, it's not wrong, it's lawful. But then we have to face a we, we have to face some kind of consequences if we do so. So thank you so much, Dr. Ani. And uh, following by Dr. Zuyati, if I would like to call upon doc, uh, Dr. Zuyati to wrap up everything in around one to two minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, as we, we can see from the discussion just now, we have the law. However, uh, the law itself cannot uh, be, uh, cannot um, ensure that our personal data is safe all the time. Okay. So it is our wisdom. Okay, um, to think about whether it is um, uh, it is uh, safe or relevant uh, to us uh, for us to share the data, and as technology and um, as technology advances and the time change, okay, I think uh, the framework for the protection of data, personal data especially, uh, should uh, be updating. Uh, and uh, in short, uh, Malaysia is going towards that. Uh, PDPA is going towards that. Uh, perhaps uh, very soon uh, with the uh, continuation of uh, uh, public consultation. Okay, so I hope um, uh, sessions tonight from all panels uh, benefit all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zuati, and uh, I'm pretty sure definitely all the participants will be benefited from it. And uh, we can see that PDPA is still developing, and we're looking for for a better privacy law or data protection law uh, that will be developing in Malaysia. So, following by uh, Mr. Damin, uh, uh, same as well, Mr. Damin, you given around one to two minutes to wrap up everything. Yeah, this is a concluding remark. I think I, I'd ask all of you um, to really start looking at the issue of privacy, uh, data protection, uh, technology law as a whole, not with the lens of what is the rest of the world doing. Also start looking at it from how do we approach it, we as Malaysia. Uh, something that John said in his presentation as well, and I share the same opinion, a lot of the things that we create in terms of legislation, regulation, uh, they are culturally based, and he was talking about it in the context of ethics. Uh, and all of these are a reflection of who we are as a culture. And I think we need to do that. We need to explore who we are by having this conversation and see what kinds of modes of data protection models and ethics uh, are going to be sufficient for us in this country without looking constantly. I mean, of course, we have goals, so the supposed gold standards like the, like the GDPR, CCPA, Virginia has their own laws. But what can we take from that and apply here? Because not all of them are going to apply in Toto here. We have to explore what they're going to be in terms of practical application. So I'd ask you to explore that by conversations like these. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Damien. Like what mentioning by Mr. Damien, we have we should spend more time on it. And instead of spending on Facebook, uh, media, so, uh, like Instagram, perhaps we should spend more on those stuff uh, said to be more beneficial. And last but not least, we have our Mr. John. Uh, Mr. John, you are given around one to two minutes to wrap up everything as a conclusion for today's webinar. Let All right, thank you. Mr. John. Yeah, sure. So if I had to do a wrap up, um, I will actually do a, a kind of a request for everybody when, you know, right now you are, most of you are, are students and at some point you're going to be, uh, you know, graduating and you're going to start moving into the the, the ladder of responsibilities and get into different positions. And some of you possibly are going to be ending up working on policy making and maybe some of you working directly for the for the government. Um, as I was mentioning before, there's uh, a lot of effort to be done when it comes to technologies being involved into all of this um, um, conversation about how to develop technology that is going to be much more user friendly by design. And, and, and we hope that there's going to be enough done in the educational pipeline to, to change that and to prepare them. Now, what I would request you is that the moment that you have some sort of capacity, please lobby for them to sit down on the same tables as you when you are doing that policy. Uh, let, let's not just keep things that have to, to deal with technology being only handled by policymakers because you're going to be losing 
a lot of very good insight as to how to implement things. Think about it this way. It would be absolutely strange to have um, urban safety committee trying to, to, to move forward some regulations without involving any architect, would it be? Uh, it, it, we need to start bringing in, because a lot of those solutions are in the hands. And sometimes they're not invited enough to actually be able to communicate those. So that would be my request. The day that you have um, some ability to invite them, to try to try to request rate, try to try to lobby for the for the opportunity to have technical voices in the in the table. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John. Uh, well said. We not only need to rely on the policies, but we need to take our action on our own. So thank you so much. So thank you so much from the panelists. Uh, before that. We have come to the photography session. So participants, uh, panelists, kindly switch on your camera for the photography session. So uh, guys, you may now turn on your camera so you'll be featured in our, in our photograph. So feel free to open your camera. And for information, we have around 180, more than 180 participants join us for our webinar. So it's uh, it can consider as a big success for Elsa UUM. So participants, if you would like to request you to open your camera. Yeah, we have more and more participants opening their camera. Yes, 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 we have more. So uh, our committee, please be ready to take the photograph. Can we have more participants? Yeah, for the first page, you're already really full. And now it's for the second page. It's okay if you didn't change your background as long as you, you're willing to open your camera. All right, um, everyone, please get ready. Smile, one, two, three. Hold on. Another one, please. Smile, one, two, three. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Suwei, for that. Thank you, and thank you also for your kind cooperation. And I think that's the end of our second episode of Legal Webinar on data protection. Is it safe for you to share all your personal information? Once again, I would like to express my utmost gratitude to our panelists today. We have Dr. Ani, Dr. Zuyati, uh, Mr. Damin, and Mr. John for the informative and I would say fruitful session as well as the participants. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. And worry not, we'll upload the recorded version of tonight's webinar on our Elsa UM YouTube channel. So feel free to check it out later on. So we hope to see you again in our future legal webinar. And most importantly, participants, you are now welcome to scan the QR code for attendance. And as for the UEM student, you will be rewarded the merit marks after you do so. Besides, we kindly request our participants to fill in the feedback form that has been sent to the legal webinar group via WhatsApp. Thank you so much for the participants and thank you so much for the panelists. Dear participants, you may now leave the meeting after you do so. Thank you so much and till we meet again. Good night and sweet dreams. Thank you so much, panelists. Bye. We we'll see you again. <laughs>